Okay, here we go. All right, so thank you for joining me today. I have Lisa Mitchell and Lauren Brill. Lisa, can you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I am a multi-passionate individual, so I like to play in a lot of different spaces. Um, for my primary work, I am a, in the communication space. So I spend a lot of time on stage working with um, executive teams, doing executive coaching, just helping people better understand how they're showing up in a room and how that impacts the outcome that they're getting. Um, and also how to read other people a little bit better. So um, my, my kind of niche areas are body language and nonverbal communication. And I'm a certified forensic interviewer as well. So how we Very say it. Good. Always body. happy to have a fellow CFI. Thanks, Lisa. How about you, Lauren? Share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, I spent most of my career as a journalist, mostly on TV. I was a sports caster and I've interviewed everyone from LeBron James to Peyton Manning. The list goes on and on. And then about two years ago, I decided to start my own company and it's a media company, an online uh, digital media company, and it's called The Unsealed. And we help people share their stories in the form of open letters. And some of them I ghostwrite and other letters people submit as part of our community. All right. Very good. Well, we're here in celebration of International Women's Day, and obviously it's just one day, but here at WZ, we're looking to celebrate it throughout the whole month. And I'm so happy to have you uh, joining me today as we talk about some women's issues. Um, so first, I, I'm curious your thoughts. What are some of the challenges facing women today in business? I can pass this to either one of you. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of challenges facing any minority in business. Uh, for women specifically, I think some of the problems include not taking women seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, for me personally, there's been way too many instances where people have tried to dangle a job opportunity or a chance to get ahead in exchange for uh, a date or some sort of sexual oh, that event. good old quid pro quo yeah and so that that always was really troubling to me I mean hitting on you is one thing but like hitting on you and then with knowing that your your career opportunity hangs yeah. in the balance I just hate it that was not okay with me and I think that's really problematic and I think it makes women question their worth at times mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to be really strong and confident to be able to combat some of these uh, instances that occur in business. Um, I think other challenges include personal challenges. Some women are mothers and they need a good partner or they need someone else in their life to help them be the mother they want to be as well as the, the employee or the businesswoman they want to be. So I think there is, there, it's, the challenges come both in the environment in terms of business environment and also um, personally outside of, uh, outside of the workforce. It's multifaceted. Yeah, very good. How about you, Lisa? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, very, very kind of similar experiences there with the, a lot of the women that I work with, um, specifically in the technology space and kind of that executive leadership space. It's uh, a lot of having to do more to prove equal base of knowledge or build equal amounts of credibility, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. oftentimes they see their male counterpart being given the benefit of the doubt. Um, being recognized or receiving accolades or in some cases funding um, based on on reputation or assumptive clothes of success where mm -hmm. their female counterparts and as a female founder in technology as well I've experienced it it's the, the question is always why you yeah and it yeah. doesn't matter how qualified or what your credentials are or how many successful endeavors you've had it's it's well why you mm -hmm. and I've also seen women who are perfectly credible and capable on their own be encouraged to bring on a male counterpart of equal or greater stature title wise to be able mm -hmm. to be considered for opportunities that they're entirely and wholly qualified on um, on their own. So, Lisa, so you, I was going to say, you, you used a word that I, I've heard so many times, uh, credible. It's about credibility and credible. And I've actually been told we believe you can do the work. We believe that you're smart. We believe all these things about you, but you, but our viewers won't think you're credible. You'd like other people don't perceive you as credible. It's not that I didn't have the knowledge or the ability. It was that the perception to other people of other people was that I wasn't credible. And even just being able to say, say that, like as a reason why I was being paid less or a reason why I was getting less opportunity, 
is horrifying and it's troubling. And so credibility, that word, it's almost like a trigger word for me at this point, because it, it didn't, it wasn't based on anything real credibility wasn't based on my resume. It wasn't based on my ability. It wasn't based on my knowledge. It wasn't based on how hard I work. It was just based on other people's perception or other people's perceived perception, how they perceived <laughs> other people perceived me, not even, it was so indirect. And that was what decisions were being made up on. I was like, is this, is this real? Yeah, I mean, I think women in general and specifically in my experiences and what I see with the people I work with is that there's a, a bias of question versus a bias of confidence Yeah. when it, when it comes to assessing someone's credibility as, as a, as a woman in any position and really across industries, I play in, in all sorts of spaces and it, it's universally a, a challenge for the women that I, that I work with. Now you both said, we, so we talked about credibility here and you mentioned confidence. Do you see a difference between credibility and confidence when looking to interpret someone's resume or in holding conversations with somebody? Is there a clear, definite, uh, defined line in between confidence and credibility? I almost see them as two separate things, just in the way I've interacted with those two words. Like for me, credibility was always about how other people may or may not perceive me and mm -hmm. confidence was how I perceived myself. Okay. So if I perceived okay. myself in a way that was strong and powerful and that, that confidence that created confidence and credibility was independent of how I perceived myself, perceived myself and how, um, and what I was capable of. It was just other people's perception based on, I don't know what their criteria was. And a lot of people unfortunately have bias criteria. I always tell the story when I was in high school, I didn't really understand gender bias. I didn't understand that we were still stuck on all these issues and problems in terms of um, discrimination. Cause I grew up in a household where I was equal to my brother. So I thought all these problems were like way old, like way back then when, and I had a teacher, I was, um, I was in an advanced math class. I was already a year ahead in school. And then I was in an, an, an honors class. And I answered some really difficult math problem. And my teacher looks at me, it was the first month of school and he goes, wow, you're a lot smarter than you look. And I'm 15 years old, right? So like, I don't know what that means. And I said to him, I'm like, what? And I'm embarrassed. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, you're just a lot smarter than you look. And I went home and I asked my mom and my mom called the principal and was like, we need to talk about this. But there, that's still an issue in our society where yeah. people are basing credibility on something external, even as, yeah. you know, I was a 15 year old child and I had, to, I'm like, I got into this class like everybody else. Like I took the same exams and I did the same work that qualified me for this class. So why would you think that I wasn't as smart as somebody else in here? Yeah. And so I think that when we talk about credibility, it's other people's perception based on their own criteria, which we can't control. I can't yeah. control your, your, um, what you're judging me on. Only I can only control what I judge myself on. And I think that's the difference between confidence and credibility is credibility is other people's perception and confidence is your own perception based on your own criteria. Very good. Now you mentioned um, gender bias in, in your, your comment there. What are your thoughts around the role that gender stereotypes play in creating uh, challenges for women in the workplace? Yeah, I, I'll kick that one off because I think one of the things, you know, and it's, it's not to be excused by this, but it is just to be acknowledged by this of that we feel most comfortable with people that remind us of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So when you're in an in industry or you're in a dynamic or you're in a conversation where it's predominantly male or everyone kind of looks and acts and comes from the same pedigree, except for you, right? Or a small number of people, it is there, the bias is towards um, feeling more comfortable or most confident in people who remind you of yourself. Right. And so I think just starting with the, with the deck that is so unevenly shuffled from the beginning kind of creates that. And most people aren't even aware that they have mm -hmm. that bias or that preference to, to feel comfortable, i.e. Yeah. like people like myself or bring other people like myself into the organization or the conversation, but it's just how we're wired. And, and if you aren't willing to do the work of, of raising your hand and being like, yeah, that is my propensity or that is where I feel more, most comfortable. It's that much harder to kind of overcome and be mindfully intentional about yeah. who you are inviting into your organization or into those roles or into those conversations. So it's, 
it's yeah, it, it's your natural propensity to seek the comfort of someone like yourself, but that is not an excuse to continue to operate in a way that creates that. And, and that's just kind of, I think, a universal challenge in so many industries right now is getting out of that comfort zone or, or the default mode of I, I work best with people like me, right? It's, it's a cop out, it's lazy, um, and it perpetuates a lot of the problems that we're already seeing right now. Yeah, I think back to what Lauren just mentioned using that that phrase that I think has been around for a long time. You look a lot uh, smarter than, or you're you're smarter than you look. Yeah. Um, it's an old school phrase, but it actually is very hurtful to some people. And Lauren just shared that example that it, I, I think about. You know, the way things have always been. You know, if it's not fit, or it's not broken, don't fix it. It actually is broken. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the words that people use in every day, although I'm going to assume he, the person who made that comment to you didn't mean harm, but it actually is a harmful comment. Mm -hmm. So we have to be mindful to the words we use um, and not only the words, but the environment, who the audience is, who the participants are, all that stuff. And it takes flexing outside of that comfort zone because, again, it's something that's always been. Um, but it's about changing that status quo. And this year's uh, topic or, or hashtag break the bias with International Women's Day is all about that. Yeah. And for me, gender bias in the workforce uh, was extremely um, blatant because I worked in sports for so many years. And so I often was the only woman in the room or the only woman on TV in the market. And I, ha I saw bias both from viewers and fans and then from um, internally from people I worked with or people I was competing with. I, when I was in Buffalo, I was breaking a lot of stories and I was like, you know, 25 years old, 26 years old. And here I am beating all these people that, um, that were in the market for 20 years. And they were mean to me. <laughs> like I, when I say they were mean, they bullied me like, like grown men bullying me on Twitter. And there was one other woman who worked in the mar market and she was a sports writer. And I was like, what is going on? Like, why are these people so mean to me? And she was like, Lauren, nobody wants to get beat, but no one wants to get beat by the girl in pink lipstick and a mini skirt. I was like, <laughs> all right, let me get a pink purse to match it. Like, then I just started like going up another notch with it. But she was right because there was still this, this idea of don't get beat by a girl, which is gender mm -hmm. bias, that it's emasculating to get, have a woman do better than you. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of instances and I experienced instances where like, if you're a woman and you're doing better than a man, they will do anything to hurt you and stop you because they feel, it feels emasculating. Like you're not supposed to be better than me. You're not supposed to get this. I'm not, I'm supposed to get this. And so it was like, they would have been okay if I like, if I cooperated with gender roles and I was willing to be beneath them, but because I was trying to fight side by side and like be equal and do my job and not be like a secretary or something. Actually, I don't want to say secretary, be someone, their assistant, if I, I would, didn't want to put myself beneath them in any, any way. Um, that created a problem. And I think that's rooted in gender bias and, and it's rooted in this, these ideas that people grow up with that, you know, don't get by, beat by a girl and you know, you're supposed to be the superior one. You're supposed to be faster, stronger, smarter, whatever it is. And that creates a much more complex work environment for, for women. And then there's also the other, you know, more obvious, things that we think of gender bias from, you know, oh, you're a girl, what could you know about sports? You never played football. Well, no, this guy. <laughs> yeah. So. Very good. What are some of the factors you feel contribute to the different ways that men and women are treated in the workplace? Okay. It starts at the top. Yeah. Right. If you have a boss that says, hey, if you do this that or that, or, you know, if you treat women poorly, you're out. I mean, I use the example, I, when I was in Cleveland, I covered the Browns and Hugh Jackson was one of the very few coaches who had a nonprofit for women, um, for, for, it was a human trafficking nonprofit. So it was geared toward women and he had a no, poli a no tolerance policy for abuse toward women. And I was treated very well in that locker room. Like mm -hmm. everyone was respectful. Everyone was nice. And that was because at the top, there was a clear message. We respect women here. And I think that's true in corporations too. If people see the boss dismissing women and people see the boss mm -hmm. paying women less or giving them lower positions, then everyone else has permission to treat them the same way. Yeah. 
Pretty yeah, good. I think culture plays a, a huge role in that and, and how the tone is set. And then also it's, it's, you know, to your point earlier, it's, it's where does your support, what is your actual level of support versus what you want people to believe, right? If you're only supportive when I'm comfortably beneath you, yeah. right, then that's not really support. When I start challenging or I'm on equal footing with you or I get just as much voting rights in a selection process or whatever we're doing, and all of a sudden you can't support me because it was okay when I was still less than you, but now it's mm -hmm. not, right? Having having those things continually challenged and and just called out, right? And, and having those those brave conversations, which sucks and it's hard, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really like some people do it and they don't know how it looks or how it feels and other people do it intentionally as to, to weaponize their position, right? And you can sort that out with the conversation pretty quickly. Pretty I think good. some of bias is so ingrained in our society that when people are biased, they don't recognize it. Yeah. Well, this is just where I belong and where you belong. This is just how it is. This is what you're supposed to do. This is, and, or they just make decisions thinking, oh, this person would make, would be better for the position, but they're basing it on appearance or, you know, they say men who are tall get more jobs. It's just, there's a lot of sub, um, subconscious bias, unconscious bias unconscious that, exist bias. In our, that are, uh, exist in our world that create a lot of, um, unfair situations. Yeah. Very good. What are some of the advances you've seen in the industry around, um, um, I don't know, let, let me rephrase it. What are some of the advances that have been made towards combating gender discrimination in the workplace? What are some of the advances that you've seen out there? I mean, I think, there's laws. Yeah, but, right. But, but I, I don't know how you feel about this, Lisa, but I'm like, you know, laws are only as good as your ability to enforce them. Yeah. So the laws are there and you can do something about it, but it's not that easy to do something about it. So I actually think while we've come a long way, there's still a very long way they'll go. Like the laws are in place, but I think there needs to be better mechanisms to enforce them. Yeah, I agree. There's legislative and statutory support uh, on the books more readily than there was before. But I, I think one of the biggest changes that I've seen is people that have been brave enough to shine a light and, and quite frankly, take a hit for, mm -hmm. for bringing attention to things that are going on and, and naming names yeah. um, and, and coming forward in that way. I think that culture of accountability of mm -hmm. like you, like you may not get called out, but you may not get away with it anymore. Right. right. I, I think it's kind of just served to put people on notice and that's not to be a threat. That's just to be like, if this is how you're going to show up in your in your workplace and in your environment, then expect that you are running the risk of being very publicly um, held accountable for yeah. that. And yeah. I think that's you know partly enabled by by media and um, you know larger cases finally getting getting the credibility that they have and actual consequences yeah. being being set forth on people that are are choosing to operate this way. I think there's a, a lowered tolerance by by women in, in in general now of what standard of behavior that they're going to accept and and people are stepping up bravely and knowing they're going to take a hit for it professionally or personally or god i i mean i and i'm sure you know lauren you've had this experience like you you challenge someone in one way online and and the trolls come for you right yeah. and they bring their friends and then the algorithm picks in their friends <laughs> the algorithm picks you up and puts you on you know angry guy tiktok and <laughs> you got to claw your way back to the back I mean, of the light again but um it's just i think it's harder to hide and so people are having the option of, of maybe pausing to consider how they're going to show up now and what consequences they're willing to face but even with that we have to be very careful because what i saw what i saw happening in sports is the good guys the guys that have always had my back and the guys that would never do anything wrong now they're terrified well, what if I say you look nice today? And they, they're not, but they're yeah. not, And I said to them, like my friend came up to me. He's like, can I not like ask somebody to go get her drinks after work? Can I not do this? I go, have you ever been, been accused of sexual harassment? He said, no. I go, have you ever been accused of sexual assault? He said, no. I said, you know why? Because you've never assaulted or harassed anyone. Mm -hmm. I said, you're afraid because you see so many people getting called out. But those people have done it over and over and over. And that's why so many women are complaining, but they don't do it to you. So you haven't seen it, but now you're scared. And now you're afraid to work with them. And now you're afraid to network with women. And now you're afraid to engage. And that's bad for women too. If people are afraid to 
build relationships with women. And so I think it needs to be very clear of like, hey, this is okay. It's okay to be like, you look nice today, but like, don't grab somebody. Don't lock them in a room and throw them against the wall. Because I think that's also very dangerous to have people not know where the line is and then be scared to engage with women because if they're scared to engage and network and have meetings with women, then women will end up being uh, held back again, just based on lack of opportunity and lack of ability to network with people. Yeah, I think we saw a lot with that with the Me Too movement over the past several years. To your point, people getting called out and you know other folks taking risks to make that call out and people are now getting caught. So I think there's a lot of progress that's been made and I certainly don't wanna minimize that particular progress, but to your point, the fact is people are now scared. It kind of, it kind of flipped the other direction where now we have individuals who are, are, aren't sure what they should say or do because it's they're only the good guys about. that are scared. Yeah. It's only the good ones, the, the bad guys are still trying to do the same thing. <laughs> But I think, you know, I think the conversation, it's a good it, incited conversation. If that's what we need to celebrate, I'm happy to celebrate that, that it elicited someone to say, is this acceptable? And is it not? And I appreciate you for following up as to why it is acceptable for a male cohort to ask you out for drinks and, and explaining why his approach was acceptable and maybe even sharing an example of what might not be so acceptable. So I love that the movement's, you know, gone on for the past couple months. It started a conversation. I certainly think, you know, there's waves here. It's, you know, waves start at one point of the world and make their way across the world. And it's just, it began those waves. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, last question I have for you. What do you, what would you say are some of the advances that have been made towards combating gender discrimination in the workplace? Did I just ask you that one? No. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry think, about that. You're good. <laughs> um, last question. Describe some of the benefits or or your takeaways, your thoughts of supporting women in, in positions of leadership. Why is this so important? Yeah, I think what in, in the corporate environment, um, specifically in, in more male dominated fields, which is where I find myself frequently, it's you can't picture yourself being something if you don't see it. Right. So having that example, having those mentors, having being being able to see a woman in an executive position or a leadership position that's given as much spotlight and as much opportunity to advocate and set policy and, and really be at the table is just is one of the best examples that you can set um, uh, of when it's not just a figurehead or to, mm -hmm. to make your, you know, you're about us page look diverse in some way. But when there's actually that opportunity to function in that role of leadership, I think that's one of the best examples you can set. Um, and, and the more we see that, especially in, in more predominantly male dominated industries, the more encouraging that will be for other women to seek those positions or go into those industries. Yeah, I mean, we have to normalize and, and encourage women in leadership positions because otherwise there's gonna, the bias continues. If you never see women in leadership positions, then we're always gonna picture a leader as a man. And so the more we support women and the more we support uh, each other, we build confidence and then we build more opportunity by breaking down that gender bias because it becomes more normal to see women in leadership roles. And so not only will women hire women, but men will hire women. Yeah, I'm hearing in the industry though, and, and I know my industry might look somewhat different than yours, but still we're all interviewers here. Um, you know, I'm hearing more and more about organizations creating um, employee resource groups. So be it women in leadership, um, underrepresented um, groups in, in these leadership positions. And so that's where I start to see progress. Again, back to my original statement, I think there's still more work to be done. But these employee resource groups that I'm seeing in organizations is a really great start. So they have individuals leading the group who may not be a leader per se in their day job, but they're leading this particular group to, again, incite conversation and, and talk about ways to overcome challenges um, through, through common themes, right? And so I, I certainly see that as progress. Again, I don't see it in every organization, but I see it in a lot of bigger organizations, which is really exciting to see. And I would encourage anybody who is curious, um, you know, about, for example, an employee resource group around women 
it, it, men can join this. Um, you know, one thing I think is so important is to have allies outside of the three of us sitting here, right? So to have those male um, counterpart allies is so important. And I think another, you know, when I think of these employee resource groups and seeing individuals from outside what the group is uh, attempting to discuss or, or overcome certain challenges to see outsiders want to join and be part of these conversations, I think is amazing. And it's a step definitely in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. And, and the challenge I put on there, I love the resource groups. I do a lot, you know, women in high tech, women in manufacturing, women in like a lot of the industries have kind of their, 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 uh, their women focused ER, ERGs. And that's great. But what I also find is that a lot of them are under-resourced yeah. and not fully supported by leadership. Yeah. Right. It, 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 and so I, the challenge that I have to organizations, kudos for recognizing that and implementing that. And the need. But support it, fully support it, financial fully support it, with programming and with executive representation, like mm -hmm. really, really fully support it or else you're just checking a box and nobody feels exactly. good. About exactly. I think there's a lot of corporations that are inauthentic about their desires to create more equality, whether it be in terms of gender equality or racial equality. And well, they have they have programs and they put out pamphlets or they do whatever, a lot of people at those companies don't actually feel comfortable speaking up and they don't actually feel like the like bi like bias is being eliminated and they feel as though it's inauthentic. And that that doesn't help anything. You know, just making it look pretty from the outside isn't valuable if actually people don't feel valued within their workspace. Right. Well, thanks for sharing. So as we close out, any final thoughts? What does International Women's Day mean to you? Why is it important to you? I know we've discussed a lot, which probably leads into this question, but what does it mean to you? What are your thoughts around this? I mean, I hope it's a day that we could also celebrate women and women who have you know, broken glass ceilings and who have paved the way so that we can take it the next step forward as far as this feminist movement that I hope continues and grows and, and evolves because it's definitely, um, there's definitely still a long way to go, but celebrate who came before us and also yeah. a reminder to fight for the direction we need to continue to, uh, to go in. Very good. Yeah, and I echo those sentiments. I think, you know, it's just about being able to feel safe to step bravely into whatever role you, mm -hmm. you choose to play. Um, as, as a woman, whether whether it's an executive or, or caretaker or whatever you mm -hmm. feel is, is your biggest point of impact and purpose and just feeling fully supported both, you know, by other women and also also by men, mm -hmm. um, just lets everybody win, right? When we're all able to, to feel good about the space that we're in and the role that we play and feel supported in that, um, yep. you know, good things happen. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time today. We'll see you later, ladies. Thanks for having me. All right. Next, we have Deborah Medina joining us with NBC Universal. Deborah, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a, an important event that you're putting on, and I'm glad to be part of it. Absolutely. Deborah, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about your career path or your, your journey? At what brought you to where you are today? Well, it's a, it's a strange path, but it, it makes a lot of sense. I am a retired law enforcement and a, a homicide detective uh, for almost 28 years. And then I went with the State Department and then as a third party contractor working internationally in Central America, working with the police in investigations and in community policing. Um, about eight months ago, I started with NBC Universal as a, an investigator. Uh, and that was an exciting opportunity because um, not only did I investigate things that are on site, but anything that has to do with NBC. And it's such a huge worldwide conglomerate. Uh, we have news, we have movies, we have productions, TV. So there was, there was a lot. During that time, I also got the opportunity to support our, um, our news division. And that led me to my recent promotion, uh, Director of Security for NBC News West Coast. Very good. And congratulations again on that Thank promotion. Thank you so much. 
And I also know you are a fellow CFI. So tell us what, what led to you obtaining that designation? When I was in Honduras, um, like I said, I'm a former uh, homicide detective investigator with um, Chicago Police Department, and I was working in internationally. Um, I decided that I wanted to look at other opportunities for advancement. Um, I did a lot of program management, investigations, working with the police, working in the security industry. And um, I also have my certification with George Washington uh, University for program management. And in the past, I had taken I, a class, I think, with Reed. And uh, Wick, Wicklander and Zelinsky is such a, um, a force in the investigative world. Um, they have so many classes. And I looked at it and saw that there was this opportunity for me to study and take this exam, which was not an easy exam, by the way. Um, <laughs> On, online because of COVID. Um, so I thought that would be a great addition to my resume. And uh, I have to say that I'm, I'm very glad that I did. Every job that I applied for after I had that, people were very impressed with that, um, yeah. that designation. Yeah, very good, very good. And very similar to my path as well. I, I went after that CFI for that progressive responsibility or looking to expand my knowledge. And I also love when I see credentials after one's names, it tells me, you know, they're, they are looking to further educate themselves. They're up to date with the standards and, and, and techniques that are out there. And again, it's that demonstration of continued education, which is really important to me. Um, so very good, very good. So you mentioned also you transitioned from the public sector to the private sector. Tell me, what were some of the pros and cons or how did that look for you? Uh, it's very interesting because I was looking at several other government jobs, a lot of them um, outside of the United States, and I just happened to come across this position with NBC. And um, I have to say that it has been an adjustment. And luckily, I had a phenomenal boss who helped me because when I went from um, law enforcement to State Department, I had to learn their procedures and state speak. You have to be able to format your reports, uh, your conversations, your training um, to, a, to a federal government level. And now I had to transition both of those into a corporate, into a corporate manner. And it, it's, been, it's been an incredible experience. Um, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot of support. Um, NBC is a phenomenal organization to work for. And uh, I, I love that I've gone to the private sector. I didn't think I would love it as much as I do, but I do. Very good, very good. Yeah, I've heard such positive things about your organization. So you're very lucky there with NBC. Now tell me, what are some of the challenge, uh, excuse me, challenges um, you feel or you've seen women face in the business world? Um, I would have to say that um, it's, it's been a journey. When I started on the police department, there was less than 10% women on the police department. So there's this fine line that you have to ride where you are presenting yourself as an officer or in the state department as a capable person before you are a woman, um, because you don't wanna receive special favors because of your gender, but you also don't wanna be punished because of your gender. Right. So it's a very fine line. I have to say that um, my experience with NBC has been quite different than that. Um, they are very, um, they look for opportunities for women, for the LGBTQI community. Uh, they're very, um, a very progressive uh, organization. So I don't feel that I've had the challenge as much in this organization as I have in the past. Okay, that's great to hear, great to hear. Um, so you mentioned that you haven't experienced any challenges. Um, what, are, what would you say are some of the benefits to supporting women in the leadership roles? Or what have you seen with your organization specifically? Um, with my organization specifically, um, they, they saw my dedication, they saw how hard I was willing to work. And I think that that is, that is, the, that is the key. Um, you have to focus people on your work and not your gender. 
and that has been uh, that has been pivotal for me throughout yeah. my career. And and when there, especially when I worked in Central America, um, you're dealing with a Latin culture that is very machismo. And I had various situations where I would be dealing with high level police officials that were borderline inappropriate with their conduct towards me because that was what was accepted in their culture. And uh, instead of getting offended, instead of uh, yelling at them, I would pull them aside and I would be like, you know, boss, uh, I understand that this is how you have handled things in the past, but in my culture and in my position here, it's very disrespectful to treat me like that. And I need you to focus more on what I have to offer and work and keep professional, very professional, not, not address personal, not how I'm dressed or, or things like that. Very good. So this year's International Women's Day kind of theme is breaking the bias. Um, so based on what you're sharing, it sounds like, um, you know, just having a direct conversation with somebody is an effective start to breaking that bias. Um, have you seen here in, be it here in the United States or in your current role or even in the past, I guess you could say, what's some of, what are some of the, the gender stereotypes um, have you seen and, and how have they created challenges for other women um, that you've worked with, be it on a project or within a particular organization? Well, luckily in my current position, I, I really haven't had that. I, I've been back in the States now for, for eight months, but in the past I have seen um, that women were not being seriously considered for roles because they looked at them as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, and felt that they wouldn't be able to dedicate the time or attention that was necessary for a particular role. Um, I have mentored a few people while they were looking for jobs and once again, I told them, uh, you, you can absolutely acknowledge that you are a woman and a mother. That is part of your life. But men have to acknowledge that they are husbands and fathers as well, and that they have responsibilities to their family. But be honest about the time that you consider work hours. And the other thing is, we're so... We're so focused on trying to get ahead and putting in long hours and showing that we're gonna work harder than anyone. But uh, in general, if you were to die tomorrow, they would fill your position. Yeah. So work very hard while you're working, but if you need time off or vacation, they have to respect that. When you took a position, uh, they said you're gonna get this amount of vacation. Do not feel guilty for taking time up apart for your family and for yourself. Right, right. And I think it really comes back to, we just mentioned this, that allyship, right? So taking a partner, be it somebody, it doesn't have to be a woman, it could be somebody else and explain, hey, these are the challenges. And I so appreciate that you brought up mentorships. I think that is such a beneficial way for women to get involved with other women to share common experiences. And, and we're not alone in the challenges that we face. And um, not only sharing those experiences, but sharing what's worked well to overcome some of these challenges and what hasn't. And I think it's having that support system, being it at home in the business, or even a combination of the two can absolutely assist in breaking that bias and, and just having conversation about in general life, right? So you mentioned not only women are women parents, but men are parents as well. We all face these same challenges. And to your point, I do agree. I see women in the industry that put in that extra work, you know, be it working extended hours, not taking that PTO or that um, encouraged time off, which could really impact your mental, right? The mental side of things. Again, not only for women, but men as well. So I, I appreciate that um, from you. As you reflect upon your career, Debbie, what do you attribute to your high level success as it at being a woman in this industry? Um, I would have to say the work ethic that my parents instilled in me. Um, my mom and my dad used to tell me, work harder than everybody else. Um, make sure that you pay attention to detail and always seek more knowledge because 
when I was starting out as a young teenager, they were like, if they're going to fire somebody, they're not going to fire you that knows your job and three other people's jobs as well. They're going to fire the person that only does the bare minimum. And that has been my, my guide through my career. Um, if I saw a position that I wanted, I looked at that position and said, what is going to make me the standout candidate for that? Um, when I wanted to switch from uh, city government and then federal government working for the State Department, um, I have not had any experience in uh, loss and prevention, in HR. Um, I saw my the CFI as a step into getting into that loss and prevention, into that HR, um, to show that not only could I interview and interrogate uh, homicide suspects or witnesses, but I could do this in the private sector as well. Um, I sought out program management. You have to expand where you think you might go. And the other thing is you need to have people that will support you. If you have relations with people, maintain them. Uh, I'm speaking with people from 20 years ago that will have something in common now. Yeah, all good stuff. What do you feel will be the biggest challenge for um, the generation of women coming in behind you? Um, I think the biggest challenge is going to be, um, we're in a different world right now, um, mid COVID. Uh, people are working from home a lot. Um, people are um, afraid to, to go out into other fields. Um, I think that and not having that that personal connection with people yep. is going to be a drawback for women, but generally for everybody. Um, I think that when you work in an, a, a work environment where you have different types of people, you learn how to work with different types of people and build those relationships. Um, and the problem is now with everybody working from home on computers, there's that lack of physicality with someone and that lack of bonding. Um, some of my mentors have been women in high positions and I have felt when I was working in the State Department and as a third party contractor for the State Department that it was very important to identify women and help them transition into this world. We need to support, women need to support women in this world. Very good, very good. Couldn't agree more. And last but not least, last question I have for you, and I truly appreciate your time today. What would, would be your advice or what's kind of your thoughts around this year's celebration of International Women's Day? Again, the theme is breaking the bias, but what, what does it mean to you? What's your personal message? I guess my personal message would be um, not and it's hard, I know, I, I put in very long hours for work sometimes, and sometimes I'm traveling, but we need to reach out um, as, as humans for human, humanitarian projects. There are so many projects where we can donate time and attention um, to underprivileged women. Uh, maybe it's by donating clothes uh, so that somebody can go out for an interview. Maybe it's going to a school and giving them tips and clues on how to interview, um, how to interact, what paths they can take, ask what they're interested in. I believe mentorship is so critically important for breaking that bias. Um, and the other thing is women and men, but right now we're only talking about women, is we need to learn to take um, constructive criticism and not take it as something personal. Even if somebody says it to you very negatively, take a step back and think, what was their message? You know, are they trying to tell me something or is it an insecurity in themselves? Because we can learn how to deal with professional relationships and personal relationships and work relationships. Um, there's something to learn every day. So I, I think that's the thing is to support women, encourage women, but just keep pushing on. Yeah, a couple of things I love in your message there. So you talked about taking time to support others and it can be from a mentorship standpoint, it could be from a project standpoint, but even the little time that we have, 
you mentioned about donating clothes, right, to women looking to get into um, some sort of field or even entry level, just getting into the workforce. Um, you know, that comes to mind. I think there's an organization called Dress for Success and even Habitat for Humanity does a lot yes. of work around helping um, be it uh, somebody coming from a domestic violence situation, somebody who's, who's um, not in the best situation and is really looking to become a professional for the very first time. There's a lot of different organizations out there that do some really great, great work. And from a mentorship standpoint as well, that's a really great starting point. Um, and I, the other point that you shared there that I really do love is around recognizing why somebody may say the things that they do. So here we're talking about, we're, we're celebrating International Women's Day, but really when it comes down to differences in the workplace, be it from a, a gender standpoint, a racial standpoint, whatever it may be, um, just really understanding the differences and how we can all work together and how those differences can make us actually more inclusive. It shouldn't be a, a divide. It, it should bring a lot of um, inclusion into the conversation project, even workspace. So recognizing, you know, no matter their background or whatever it is, there's always value to someone joining the conversation at the very minimum. Um, and recognizing what those values are, I think is incredibly important. And again, I, I, I personally believe those in itself will help begin the process that's already, or excuse me, I should say, continue with the process that's already out there and breaking the bias and, and recognizing those differences is really where we should go eventually. I absolutely. Sometimes people just need to be heard. Yeah. They want to know that you are listening to them. And uh, I, I'm very, I mean, I, I hate to just be harping on NBC, but seriously, I am working for an organization that is all about inclusiveness and mm -hmm. recognizing the differences. And as a corporation, I don't think I've ever felt more supported um, and seeing such efforts being made to make sure that we are all a community. Yes, very good. Well, Debbie, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for all your insight and your professional opinion and, and, and just being here and, and being a woman. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. This is an incredible opportunity. These opportunities weren't available when we were starting our careers. So I, I, I think it's, I think it's very important that we support women and that we help women make that next step take that next job and feel like they have the tools to do it. Yeah, and they deserve that seat at the table. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you again, Debbie. Thank you for including me.